Viviana and I are, are sharing the, uh, the lecture today. Uh, Viviana and I have been working together for a while now. Uh, I don't know how long a while is, Viviana. Do you remember? <laughs> Since the beginning of the universe. <laughs> so we now sort of know a lot about each other in our work and so on, and we have interests in common. And um, the, the particular topic of this class is, I think, a really important one, and, and Viviana brings a lot to it. And uh, so what this is about is um, how communities actually collaborate. You know, it's very easy for us to put into that arrow. Yeah, yeah, and then everything happens wonderfully. You know, people who are paid nothing just collaborate, and it's all marvelous and all the rest of that. But uh, how does that happen? You know, how does that happen? Because it does. It's, it's fascinating, but um, I don't know how many of you are aware of this wonderful uh, anecdotal thing, but um, back, in, back in the old days uh, when they were working on aerodynamics and uh, first beginning to understand the theory of it, aerodynamics, it, uh, it, it, somebody did research on the bumblebee and said it's quite apparent that the bumblebee cannot fly to which another entomologist in this case, an insect uh, researcher, reported back how lucky for the bumblebee that it doesn't know that it can't fly because it does. And so analogously, uh, what Viviana and I are working on is it's also the case that economists and those who study firms assume that a free innovation community can't work. You know, unless you're paying people, unless you have a boss that'll stop your salary, unless you do this or that, unless you have another boss who decides between you and this other person because you have a conflict, it just can't work. And yet, analogous to the bumblebee, it does. And it's utterly fabulous, and it's a sort of a new area to try to figure out, well, why is that the case anyway? Nobody had to study it before because they assumed that uh, firms were dominant, right? And this didn't matter anyway. Whoever heard of a volunteer community? So, um, oh dear, what have I done here? Um, so, today's agenda then is I will talk about the importance of collaboration to accomplishing big things in the free innovation paradigm. And then Viviana will talk about her research on how it's done in practice. And it's, it's really, I, I, I find it so interesting and I hope you do too. All right, so now, here's the economic reason why it really matters that multiple people can collaborate. Basically, the assumption, one of the assumptions that made people think, oh man, you know, it's never going to be the case that consumers can compete with producer innovators is because of scale. In other words, a company, see the producer there in green? A company can spend a ton of money, huge design costs, because it can spread its costs over many customers. In contrast, a single DIY user trying to develop something for him or herself can only spread costs over themselves in their own use. And so you see the consequence here in that example I showed you last time about center pivot irrigation. The user is hacking together something out of stuff that he has around on his farm. Those are old agricultural implement wheels because he really couldn't afford to buy new ones and that's irrigation pipe that he always had used on the field prior to making this mobile device. And then in contrast, you can see down below, the innovation was done by the user, hacked together, the concept was. But as you can see down below, the manufacturer could pour a ton of money into R&D, quote unquote, or engineering really, 
product engineering so that they could uh, make something that many people could use that would be more reliable than the farmer's design and so on. So bottom line, if users, free innovators could not collaborate, we would be stuck with a bunch of mini projects. Linux and so on would not exist. It would all be like mini apps. Here's another example, you know, a single DIY user. You remember I told you about uh, uh, the artificial pancreas? A single DIY user, uh, major investment in duct tape there you can see on the top, little picture. Uh, the the uh, patient, the diabetes sufferer already had that device at the bottom, a pump, and they had the other device as well and the care link and they, hooked them all up, you know, in some hack way. And then the manufacturer came and did that huge engineering task on the bottom. It's a bit ironic, by the way, that the one on the bottom doesn't work as well as the one on the top. But uh, I tell you, users are where it's at. All right, so now, what's happened? It turns out that users, free innovators, can also share their costs. But they do it not by selling something to a customer. They do it by each doing a piece of the innovation project that adds up to a bigger project. And they each contribute their piece, not because somebody's paying them, but because as we saw in a prior lecture, I think even the first lecture, they are self-rewarded. So people come in and they say, damn it, I have a need for this thing. I'm gonna do a piece of this. And they do. And when you add up all those pieces, suddenly you get something quite massive that can compete with producer innovation in scale. So here you have, in the case of software, you have a single person app development project, you know, I mean, it's now easy enough to develop an app so a single person can do it using the toolkits that Apple supplies. And then you have uh, a producer massively investing in an operating system. And then you have this sort of like, whoever thought it would work, Linux. You know, historically, you remember uh, uh, Linus Torvalds posting on the web, hey, I'm doing this project. Anybody else want to do a bit of it? And before you know it, it really has driven conventional commercial computer operating systems into the weeds. So it's, it's a very impressive thing. It works and it is a sharing process. Now, what's happening in the case of Linux is again, the manufacturers don't believe it. They don't give up. They keep investing in their stuff. And they get hammered. Encyclopedia Britannica never believed that Wikipedia could come in and hammer them. They kept investing and in, uh, hiring their writers and so on and so forth, and they couldn't believe what happened. Now, here is a wonderful example that happened, you know, the core of this happened at MIT. It was kite surfing. And kite surfing was invented by individuals who together made a community. They love to do this kind of activity together. And what they did was they hacked everything together and they built these kites and they shared their designs. And you can see it's really ending up being quite sophisticated. Namely, what you see here is a bunch of control lines. You see these curved novel kinds of kites involving sophisticated aerodynamics. And then you see these boards on the bottom that are custom made. And a particular guy, Saul Griffith, who uh, was at MIT, um, I went and visited his, uh, his quote lab when he was a grad student. He was a central person in this kind of community effort. And he had a whole bunch of uh, highway signs in the corner. I said, what? He said, well, I find that highway signs, when you cut them up, make fabulous board materials. 
And I thought, jeez, <laughs> a true do-it-yourselfer without certain kinds of morals, but nevertheless is true do-it-yourselfer. Anyway, so then what happened was this became a big sport. A couple hundred million dollars worth of things, thousands of people building their own kites. And so then the manufacturers came in and they said, basically, stand aside, children. This has now reached adulthood. We will each hire one and a half engineers and we will just drive you guys out of the water and we will introduce a new model and we will patent the heck out of things. And every year you'll buy a new one from us because we'll introduce a new model, as I said, and it's gonna to be totally wonderful. Well, uh, a number of companies entered in in this way and uh, all that Saul Griffith did, that's here, Saul, he set up a website. He just set up a website for two cents and he called it zeroprestige.org. And what happened was people from around the world who weren't thinking that they would give themselves over to the producer and give up on this, uh, started sharing their designs in a more systematic way. So you have here a super high aspect ratio mountain board kite from Sebastian in Argentina. You have people doing all sorts of things from around the world. And what they're doing is they are sharing these designs in a very efficient way. What you can see on the right-hand side of this slide is a bunch of panels, flat panels of cloth, that when sewn together, make these kind of curved kites. And what they did when they share a design, they don't just say, here's the general shape. They say, here are the CAD files that you can take to a sail loft, something that cuts out sails, and you can use their laser cutters and so on to cut out all these panels to the millimeter. And then you sew them together and you've got an exact duplicate of my kite. Now, they also came in with kite modeling tools. They also came in with aerodynamic modeling tools because it turns out that slow speeds have aerodynamic complexities of their own. So it's like the manufacturers are standing there saying, what the hell? Your tools are better than ours. You have a hundred people, we have one and a half. What is going on here? And uh, so we took a look to see who these people were. And it was fabulous. They weren't master's degree engineers, not not to cast any shade on any of you who are master's degree engineers or so, but they were top aerodynamicists at NASA, top aerodynamicists at Boeing who were doing this on the side, top aerodynamicists from the top academic programs around the world. They were better than these people in these companies who were not collaborating either because the company mantra was, we make something special that nobody else can have. We patent the hell out of it and then you have to buy the kite from us. Bottom line, much to the surprise of these companies, they were driven out of design by the users. They began to move to a build-only specialization, leaving product innovation to the user community. In other words, they were just starting to download and build user designs and sell those instead of creating their own designs. So there's some really interesting evidence here that when this system works, it can outcompete producers, which is quite fabulous. And it doesn't mean producers are obsolete at all. From the producer point of view, what they get to do, as we see in the two paradigms, is they get to download these designs. They get to save costs. At the moment, if you go to your companies when you graduate, you will discover the company most offended at the idea that a user could possibly do what their R&D department could do. But in fact, there's a role for both, right? You just have to understand the economics of both of these when you get into your jobs. 
Okay, so here's another one. It's again, such a funny example. Let's see how I'm doing for time. I, I want to be only 10 minutes. So anyway, it's, it's sort of a funny example. It was Lego. Lego designed something called, uh, what the hell, Mindstorms, right? So it was quite a while back. And they, uh, uh, you know, did the usual Lego thing. They had five engineers in house and they worked on this thing and they worked on it for seven years. And then they finally came out, you know, they checked with uh, psychologists and so on to make sure children would not be traumatized when this robot thing was rolling around and so on and so forth. They did because they were, they were aiming at young kids and they posted it and they began to sell it to their astonishment. A thousand hackers started working on it within three weeks. A thousand hackers is a lot more than five engineers. So what happened then? Well, these hackers started running contests on the web. They started showing that their user developed software was better than the software that the Lego folks had made, which annoyed the hell out of the Lego folks. Now, anyway, what soothed the Lego folks was this was, again, the best product sales they ever had. That uh, all of a sudden it was adults buying these things. Lego was unable to keep up with demand. It was great. 70% uh, of the customers were over age 18, it became a craze. Silicon Valley firms were forced to ban Legos at work. That's how serious it became. Anyway, then what happened was Lego took a look to see where the hell these people came from. And what they found was there were 40,000 adults while they were focusing on selling to kids. There were 40,000 adults out there who had self-organized into areas of interest. You can see them here, news groups, uh, trains, castles, and so on. Nothing to do with Lego. And they said, well, why'd you call yourself Lugnet? Said the Lego people. And they, the guys in the community said, well, you know, the only people we heard from, from Lego ever was your lawyers, because we used to call ourselves Lego Users Group, L-U-G. And your lawyers told us we couldn't do that. So we changed the name to Lugnet. <laughs> and you never found us again. You never found 40,000 of us again. It's not that they couldn't have found them if they looked, it's just that the assumptions that we are the manufacturer and we serve the user is uh, so firmly embedded that nobody has been looking. This is changing now, but it's still a lot of pain and contention going on that you have to be aware of. Well, so the, anyway, so finally what they built was something they said, hey, you know what, if you have designs, why don't you share them? And uh, uh, began to adjust to the idea that users were a source of innovation that was of value to them. Now, I just want to very quickly, because Viviana is going to do a much better job of this than I, I just want to very quickly show you, uh, Kareem Lakhani over at Harvard Business School and myself, uh, we were interested in the question that Viviana is interested in. It's like, how the hell do these communities work? But we don't have Viviana's sociological background. And so we just sort of observed what was going on. We studied this kind of, you know, in, a, in an open source community, what you have is you have a bunch of, uh, uh, you know, you have a bunch of, of sort of, um, um, uh, what do you call them, um, places to post, and you can see the threads and everything. And you, what we observed in these threads was, man, this is a friendly activity. This is efficient. This is not people fighting. And so very quickly, here's an example so that you can get a sense of it. This is an example where one of the users of Postgres, which is an online database program for enterprises, basically says, well, you know, I've got a problem with very large databases. And, and what I want to do is clean out 
the matrix between projects because I don't want to keep reprocessing things that have no role in the current problem. So see, here's an idea we ought to do. Then what happened? He outlined the problem, and this will sort of go on and on. I'm going to very quickly click through it. He said, this is what I think we ought to do. He didn't say, oh, life should be better. He said, I think we ought to do this, and here's, here's a possible way to do it, right? Currently, we do this, and I think we should do that. And then what happened, within hours, is that other people began to respond. Geez, I've got that kind of problem too, but you know what? If you did uh, this following thing, you know, it would work better. And he's not saying, you know, well, Ghani, you're an idiot. He's just saying, you know, hey, how about this? Very, very direct and simple. And then, uh, you know, uh, somebody else acknowledges the problem and so on. And it's just sort of people participating. And then somebody says, listen, I'm going to work on this. And I need some information. So, so it's not that that people are saying, you know, uh, somebody else should do the work on the problem I'm suggesting. It's no, I'll do something on that, right? Which is a very different situation. So he says, sounds like a nice idea. I'll start it this week. No, by the way, in a firm, if you were doing this, nothing would happen for months while management tried to figure out whether it was a great idea, right? Is there a market for this, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. This is like, this is September 3rd. When did this guy post initially? Yeah, this is all on the same damn day. Then seven hours later, all right, I've gotten into it further. Here's what I'm planning to do. They're telling each other what they're doing. Nobody's trying to say, I've got this secret sauce and I'm not telling you about it, right? And then it keeps on going in this fashion. Good idea, interesting implications, new design, partial vacuum only. How about that? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Other approaches. And then, see, hello all, I've written a small demon that can automatically vacuum. Then what you have is you have a demonstration that it works, right? So it's not, you guys ought to do this. It's not like you have to take me on faith. It's like, listen, I'm working on the same Postgres system you are. And when I plug in this new thing, look what it does. It really speeds things up. Amazing. And then what happens is everybody says, yay, you know, did it. And what you have then is you have 23 contributors, three coders, a reviewer, testers, discussants, all self-emergent. Nobody assigned you to be the discussant. Nobody assigned him to be the coder. Nobody assigned that other person to be a tester. They just did it, and they did it enormously quickly, and they did it enormously well. So this is the puzzle now that Viviana and I, 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 I mean, Kareem and I just looked at that and said, son of a gun. And then we waited around for a period of time until we could meet Viviana, who has the proper tool set to carry us further. And so we've been having a ball now listening to her advice and, and uh, hearing from her. And so she will tell you now, we'll switch over to her and she will tell you sort of work to date and uh, how it's going, okay? So let me switch over to you, Viviana. You wanna, or are there, and, and are there comments or questions, uh, Jane, or are we good? I think we're good. Okay, good. So Viviana, your turn. And Viviana, by the way, will have a breakout session in your session, right? You'll have a breakout question kind of thing going on? Yes. Okay, great. So I would try to take over the screen. <laughs> That's the first attempt. Okay. Yeah, it should be fine if you hit the green share screen button. Ah, there we go. Excellent. 
Okay. okay. All right. Can everybody see this agenda? Mm -hmm. Cool. All right. So now we go to the famous paradigm <laughs> that we see <laughs> in one of the sessions. So Eric has already mentioned the importance for people to collaborate to create a larger innovation. Um, in all those wonderful examples, we see collaboration and people collaborate because they are driven by this potential synergy of acting together. So it is a synergy when individuals acting alone, they cannot achieve. For me personally, one of the very few positive side effect of this corona crisis is that I started collaborating with colleagues outside ETH a lot more than before. Like my wonderful collaboration with Eric, I said it started from the beginning of the universe, but actually we started collaborating much more intensively since the beginning of the crisis. So I think actually the crisis has made us rethink, redefine the boundaries of our work and life. So we actually started to work a lot more like the innovators from those online communities that we study. So we collaborate remotely and we work online. And we spend a lot, time, a, lot of, a lot more time to work on things that we enjoy doing rather than work on things that we are paid to do. So I think that's a remarkable positive side effect of this crisis. And I'm really, really, really happy and honored to have the opportunity to join you guys in this class and also today to share with you some of the findings from my own research. So I will carry on. We know that when the problem is more complex than any individual can solve alone, or when the solution really requires more resources than any individual can provide alone, the, uh, the innovators will collaborate and share the cost, and they usually do that in the communities. Last week, Andrew talked about the Night Scout, and we also know the Linux, the Wikipedia, those are all great examples. And when we think about these communities, we usually think about the very warm feeling of creating something positive together, and a great sense of belonging that you are part of a community. But today I also want to make you aware that these communities are not utopia. So the free innovation communities are not free from conflict. Here's why I'm going to explain to you. So maybe I start with the counterfactual to the human collaboration. I don't know whether you guys are familiar with the Borg Collective. No? Mm -hmm. Is there any science fiction fan here who can explain to the class what the Borg Collective is? If I don't see, Jen, do you see the volunteer? All right. <laughs> Jen, I think you've stumped us all. <laughs> I thought everybody at MIT is a science fiction fan. <laughs> so this is from the Star Trek. If you watch the older series, you will know this uh, Borg Collective is a species um, that's actually only having one collective mind, but that mind resides in multiple bodies. As a result, all the individuals in this collective have the same information and the same goal. So they know and want the same thing. So for them, there is no need for coordination because there will never be conflict with, within the individual individuals of that species. But as humans, maybe this is fortunate or unfortunate, we know and want different things. I know that because based on my own research, which is all around the, the collaborations for innovation, so when I study new venture teams, these online communities or R&D collaborations, I always find that the major challenges, there are two major challenges. The first one is the goal asymmetry. So as individuals, we want different things. When you collaborate, um, 
For example, when pharmaceuticals companies collaborate with universities, their scientists want to develop drug. They want to um, make money out of the product. And many academic researchers, they are all thinking about publishing papers. So there is this um, conflict of interest, or let's call it different goals and priorities. So we have the goal of symmetry as a challenge on the one hand. On the other hand is we bring different knowledge, different perspectives. Sometimes the chemists don't understand the language of a biologist. Here we have the information asymmetry problem. And because of this goal and information asymmetries, when humans collaborate, conflict is very hard to avoid. So when we talk about this innovation communities, we also need to take a look at how they actually resolve conflict and achieve those wonderful things, the larger innovation or the synergy when individual innovators cannot achieve by themselves. Let's also think about how is conflict usually resolved in traditional organizations? We usually have a boss, right, in a company. So when Ben and Bob don't agree with each other, they can always go to their common supervisor and ask the boss to decide. But what if you are in those free innovation communities? Or if Eric and I don't agree? So we cannot go to the dean or the department chair because we are in different organizations. Eric's dean and my team cannot tell me what to do and vice versa, my dean cannot tell Eric what to do. So how do we resolve our own, our differences? We need to resolve that through peer-to-peer -peer coordination. And that challenge is the challenge that's facing the participants in those free innovation communities every day. Because remember, there is no employment contract. There is no common boss for those community members. And they have to rely on peer-to-peer -peer coordination. The economists would say, this will not work, but we have seen that the bumblebee can fly. And now the rest of the lecture, I will try to answer this question. How do participants in these communities deal with conflict and make the bumblebee fly? Let me start with an example. So earlier, Eric has showed you how people miraculously work together. So to um, create a new module, a new program to solve a very difficult problem. Here, I want to show that there are occasional situations when they have frictions, they have challenges when they are trying to solve a problem together. We, I think many of us use Wikipedia. When I was writing my PhD thesis, I even thought about putting Wikipedia in the acknowledgement because I go there so often, as often as I consult a professor. So we benefit from this great base of knowledge a lot. Um, actually, Wikipedia has more than 130,000 editors contributing to it. And they all come from really different backgrounds. They know different things, they want different things, remember. So the result is there are conflicts and what they call this as edit war. So here I have an example. Um, the editor, I think it's called Monster Hunter, he or she, let's assume it's a, it's a he. Um, he showed up and removed one quote without any explanation. The other editor, Daniel, Daniel saw that removal. He doesn't think that's the right thing to do. So he came back to the page and restored that quote with an explanation. So this is not the war yet, but Monster Hunter came back, apparently not happy about this revert. So he removed that quote again leaving an angry note. From there, this became a war. Then you see this 
whole list of back and forth of fight between the two editors. So this is what the Wikipedians call edit war. So as I mentioned earlier, the editors, so there are 130,000 of them, they all come from different backgrounds. And these fights happen every day. I think it's almost a miracle that they actually get things done at all, given the potential for conflict. And the fact that we do get to see very stable wiki content suggests that they have a way to resolve this conflict. One explanation is that in Wikipedia community, there is very explicit procedural for conflict management. So here you can see five steps. For any dispute between editors, they are supposed to settle among themselves first. They are supposed to discuss privately. If they cannot, they will go to a talk page and talk through it. They will post a dispute, say, Eric and I don't agree, and here's the issue. And then we will invite others around us to comment. We would ask, we can even put in people and say, Jen, what do you think? Who's right? So we're putting people in violent to comment. If this still doesn't solve, the dispute can escalate to resolution, notice board, or mediation committee. These um, unofficial groups of volunteers who can help us resolve our differences. And eventually, if all has failed, the dispute can escalate to an arbitration committee, which is run by officially elected members. So this is as close as it gets to an um, authority figure in this type of communities. The puzzle is though, since funding, there are about 640,000 disputes being posted on the talk page. So there are a lot of them. However, this semi of uh, authority looking committee, the arbitration committee has only ruled about 500 disputes. That means less than 0.1% of the disputes were resolved by formal authority. That's really quite remarkable. The left asked uh, the question, so how exactly are the majority of the disputes resolved? Um, Viviana, I seem that's a great question for you, if you're okay with taking it now. Mm -hmm. Hi, Viviana, thank you so much for the, the presentation. The question that I had was, before you even get to the, the conflict management, I'm curious in your study if you have seen something called relational contracts, meaning it's not real, but between you and I, we have an understanding of what the rules are of engagement, what the rules are there. They're not like enforceable as such. You know, in economics, they say relational contracts, mm -hmm. where they're more based on understanding of each other. So is there something like that that exists in Wikipedia or in situations like this that we tend to go towards? Yeah, that's a great question, I think. Actually, you have touched upon a very important aspect of the conflict management. Actually, later when we get to the slide, you will see that your, the, the, the aspect you mentioned is actually a very important pillar in it, the relational aspect. Okay. Do you want right, to do the later slide? I'll wait, I'll wait, absolutely. Yeah, thanks, but that's a great primer. <laughs> so let's go to this slide. I think to solve the puzzle that we just seen, have seen, we need to look beyond just the conflict resolution to include the entire conflict management system. So actually you will find conflict prevention will be much more important than we originally thought. Um, earlier, I think this question touched upon the relational design. So there are two sets of design principles that contribute to reduce the conflict potential. I will start with the technological design and then get to the relational design. So 
starting with the technological aspect. This design principle refers to protocols and procedures targeting the interdependence between actors. What do I mean by interdependence? When we think about interdependence, we can think about how do we relate as individuals when we are doing the task and when we are sharing the reward. So these are the two types of interdependence. Technological design can be used to minimize interdependence. For example, in the open source software communities, also in Wiki to some extent, there are um, protocols of version control and there are protocols of modularization. So individual innovators can work independent of each other to collectively create something very complex. To give an example, I will um, go back to Lego. Earlier you saw, um, Eric showed a really fascinating example of the robot design. Here, a few years fast forward, the Lego folks have learned from their robot story. They know that the users could do much better than their own in-house five R&D people. So this time, when they launched the product, they, they launched the system, the moon base, they are a lot smarter. They try to enable users to contribute to this uh, very complex and innovative project. But in order to enable that, they utilize the modularization principle. So what they did is this entire complex system can be developed by modules. So each user could develop a small module, but these modules can be back integrated to a bigger system through the standardized elements. Here I put one airlock corridor here. You see that's a standard. And when you look at the picture, there are different modules here. For example, the rocket launch is a module. That small, smaller module is connected back to the system through the airlock. So here we see that modularization as a design principle is used to minimize the interdependence among individual innovators. So when you design something, so when I'm designing this rocket launch module, I do not need to know what Eric is doing with the larger module, either it's the space shuttle next to me. So I just need to um, mind my own business as long as I am following the same standard and use that um, airlock corridor to connect my module back. So this really enables individuals to maximize their uh, creativity. Okay. However, it's not always desirable or feasible to minimize interdependence. Sometimes we need to co-create. We need to work together to actually create something um, greater than we can create individually. Then we will need to use technolog technological design to manage interdependence in a way that collaboration will become the dominant strategy. Here is another example. Eric <laughs> told me every American kid knows this example. I didn't know this. So this is a classic problem of cake cutting. Imagine a group of children sharing a cake. How do you ensure that anyone, if given the responsibility of cutting the cake, would do it fairly? I hope you guys know. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody knows that? Because I grew up in China. I never had this problem because somebody, one adult, will cut it for us and say, Viviana, you take this piece. And then the other, <laughs> my cousin will take the other piece. We never <laughs> had the chance, you know, to actually cut it ourselves and then figure out how to do it fairly. But I was told every American kid knows that. How do you do that? I'm not the only American. I don't see any takers. But it's, <laughs> don't okay. any I remember exactly. It's 
So you cut the cake and you get to pick last. Yes, exactly. I thought that's a genius uh, solution. That's a perfect example of a technological design. You make um, collaboration the dominant strategy. So that kid who's cutting it, the dominant strategy is to do it a fair way because you are the last one to pick, right? The only way to ensure your own interest is to do it in certain way that even after all um, everybody else has picked it, you can still enjoy a fair slice of cake. So that's a perfect example. There are many um, procedures um, in these uh, communities that's making collaboration the dominant strategy. So these are great folks working in these communities, but they are still um, interest-driven individuals. There need to be certain procedural and protocol in place to encourage everybody to collaborate rather than to free ride. All right, now we are getting to the relational design. So this is the, the warmer part of the design principle. I mentioned the coder and the mechanical part first. Here, we're getting to the warmer part. Um, relational design refers to this shared knowledge and values that enable coordination and cooperation. Um, in the communities, there are two very important um, sets of principles. The first one is self-selection, and the second one is socialization. Um, these communities, they are both transparent and open. So as an outsider, you can look, you, you know what they are discussing and you know what they are doing. You can look into the community and see whether what they are doing fits your values. And you, then you can make an informed decision to self-select to join the community or not. And once you have joined, you also, um, you are also socialized through the community norms. Um, so I think earlier asked, this relational contract is really a very important um, set of principle in these communities. Here, we can go back to the example of Wikipedia. The shared knowledge among editors is that they all know how to edit the page. They know um, the, pro the, the norms to cite, to discuss, and more importantly, the editors share a set of community norms. The most famous one is the wiki love. So they take pride in creating and sharing knowledge. And they take pride in co-creating this um, encyclopedia of unprecedented sites uh, in human history. And among the editors, they also share this kindness collegiality towards each other. So they could actually work smoothly most of the time. So we have talked about the design principles that contribute to reduce the conflict potential. But these principles do not reduce conflict potential 100%. There are still residual potential that could um, realize into actual conflict. So to prevent potential um, to become, from becoming actual conflict, we also have the third party intervention. So let's go back to this explicit procedural for conflict management in the Wikipedia community. So except for the first step, when you are supposed to discuss in private and try to resolve that yourselves, the, the, the rest of the steps, actually, the editors always have a third party intervention as a possibility. Starting from the talk page, the other volunteer, common, uh, volunteer editors who provide comments are the third party. And then you have the dispute resolution notice board, then the mediation committee, and finally the arbitration committee. So you see there are a, a range of third party interventions available. And some of them are binding, some of them are non-binding. 
actually the only binding decision or suggestions that's made by the third party is the arbitration committee. The others are there to provide their opinion, to make a suggestion, and eventually the disputants themselves need to make the decision of what to do. All right, so by now we have seen the three elements of the conflict prevention system. I want you to reflect on your own experience working either in a team or a community to think about those principles and procedures that your team or community have in place to prevent conflict. How was your discussion? Yeah, we've had some fascinating examples um, in the discussion group, but I would like to invite you guys to share your favorite examples. Maybe each group can share one or two examples. Yeah, I don't want to pick from my group. I mean, who, what, who would like to volunteer? Well, they were all really interesting. Anybody from my group would like to volunteer? I'm I sure you would. Georgia or Kenny, Leslie or Sangyun. <laughs> this is so up. funny. Remember, there's no hierarchy here. Somebody has to. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody has to volunteer. <laughs> Let me volunteer. Uh, let's see. Uh, no, I won't do that. <laughs> I won't do that. I, I can go if uh, if nobody else wants to. Okay. Um, so Eric had just asked for us to think about situations where we really don't have any hierarchy or any sort of, you know, tasks associated with our responsibility or role. And I thought about this apartment I lived in that had nine people living there and you can imagine the cleaning tasks got mm -hmm. complicated <laughs> and, um, well, what, what did people had decided before I moved in was we should hire uh, someone to come and clean once a month and split the cost among everybody else. When I moved in, there was this big discussion about should we keep paying this person or should we assign tasks? And it, it ended up being decided by some of the older, well, it was decided by everybody, but the older people said, it's probably worth the money to like avoid this conflict. So mm -hmm. just pay somebody else on the outside to come in and clean so you're not upset at your roommates for leaving a mess. Okay, yeah. So in that sense, I guess you decided that collaboration wouldn't work and conflict avoidance would hire <laughs> somebody. <laughs> yeah, that's the technological design yeah, <laughs> to, yeah, yeah. to kind of uh -huh. suppress the conflict. Uh -huh. <laughs> I think. I say, say, Bernadette, you are an expert at this. Can you comment from your group? I've got somebody that's chopping down a tree, so it keeps. It's popping up, so I think it's going to be very disruptive today. Okay. <laughs> All right. Irving mentioned something really fascinating. I think I would let him to tell us that from the political science book. Oh, sure. I'd, um, I'd be glad to do it. Uh, what uh, Viviana is referring to is uh, a book um, I mentioned uh, by, uh, by Harvard uh, political theorist John Rawls, in which he developed the concept of uh, the veil of uh, justice. And the idea is, how do you design a society that is just for all? And the mental experiment he suggested all to play out uh, in their minds is, imagine you're being born into a society. And in advance of being born, you don't know whether you'll be born poor or rich, or Democrat or Republican or any other form of denomination used by human society. You didn't know who you were going to become. That was going to be completely random. So how do you design a society such that you are happy with the outcome, whatever you become, right? And that's the veil of justice. You place the veil of justice. You don't know who you'll become. Mm -hmm. um, and the other example I mentioned to Viana about relational design. Last year, we had the opportunity of launching a new MIT program in Japan. And so it was for the first time in my life that I got experience of interacting within the Japanese business culture. And I was completely astounded by how people in Japan care about protecting each other's reputation and saving face. And whenever we had an opportunity for conflict, whenever 
conflict was even a mile in sight, people would start working intensely behind the scenes, resolving matters, but making sure that publicly everyone looks good. And I was so <laughs> astounded and impressed by that. Wow, that's really interesting. Yeah, thanks, thanks. Thank you. Yeah. Great examples. Thank you. So maybe we carry on. Mm -hmm. All right. So, so far we have covered the design principles and the explicit procedures, and we have heard some fascinating examples. However, two questions remain. What if these principles- Can you share your screen again? Mm -hmm. Oh, it's not shared. I don't, I don't see it. Maybe others do. When we come back from the breakout rooms, you just need to hit share ah. again. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Is it not yet? Oh, there we go. <laughs> cool. Okay. Now we're back. Yep. So we have two questions remaining. What if these principles and procedures do not completely prevent conflict? And what if, what is the real process they resolve conflict in and between any of those procedures? And what's coming next is the process of conflict resolution in this free innovation community. So here we go again. The conflict management system. Now we're going to take a deep dive into this conflict resolution process. Here I have an example from the GitHub community. So GitHub is the world's largest host platform for software development projects. And the majority of those projects are open sourced. And in these communities, there is at least one owner who initiates the project. But there is no employment contract, so the owner really has no formal authority over other participants. And these communities share similar design principles as in the Wikipedia community. So they have also this version control, modularization, and it has very strong community norm. But different from the Wikipedia community, the GitHub community does not have any of those explicit procedure or any of those committee like in the Wikipedia case. So here, the community members really face a more difficult job actually in resolving their own conflicts. So what my colleagues and I did is we studied 183 conflict episodes so we went to the discussion page and sampled 183 episodes around a particular decision, which is the software license decision. In these communities, the software license decision, it is the most important and contentious decision. The reason why is that these license um, defines the legal instrument legal framework that governs this community. And it also influences all the downstream innovation. So whether the downstream software product can be a copy left or the copy right type of product is all determined by those license. And here we can see from the table, the first three columns are all open licenses. Although being open, they have a very different degree of openness. You see, some license will make the owner relinquish all the rights, the ownership rights and the user, uh, the use rights. And the other licenses, some of them grant only the use right and allow privatization, while the others grant the use right but forbid privatization. Last class, Sophie asked a question, how do we prevent um, commercial um, users, so the commercial companies from taking advantages of what is created in the um, open innovation community to take those products and privatize them and make them commercial products? 
by using certain license, you could prevent that. But preventing it might also have disadvantage because you are restricting your product from being used by certain group. So this almost ideological like debate, how open should your software product be? How permissive should you make your product to allow further innovation? So these are really grand debates for the community members. We focus on these type of conflicts so we can really get to the bottom of it. How do community members solve the problems, the conflict that's, that are most important to them? Here's what we found. We found that these conflicts start very differently. They could start with a discussion around different license alternatives. So here we see that in this project called Elegant Mind, one owner came in and she started the discussion like, oh, should we adopt this license called GPL2 or LGPL? So she started a discussion about which one of the license is better. And then another owner came in and proposed a third alternative. What about the MIT license? Then the whole discussion became a bargaining, a bargaining among different owners, participants, which one of the license is better. As you can imagine, it's very hard to resolve something like this when people are making normative claims of A or B is better than the other. Alternatively, a conflict will also start with a discussion of the attributes underlying different licenses. Here in the project VIS, we have the owner started the discussion as, okay, folks, we need to adopt a license. We need to change our previous license into another one. Here are a list of attributes that are desirable for us. So he listed, okay, we want as much freedom as possible. We want protection. We want to fair attribution. So these three attributes he proposed are the important ones. And later the discussion unfolded as what are the attributes that are important for the community? What are the values that they agree or disagree? Then the process becomes a problem solving process, a search along certain attributes that they could agree as desirable attributes. So we put it in um, a figure that you can see clearly how the different framing as the beginning of the conflict could lead to different passes of conflict resolution. You see the alternative based discussion leads to a bargaining process and then the attribute based discussion leads to a problem solving process. Why does this matter? So, okay, they take different passes. Why does it matter? Here, we found that these two different types of um, passes or different process of resolving a conflict have very different likelihood of reaching a resolution. So if you take pass two, you based your um, conflict on attributes. So what really matters for the community as a whole. So there is common ground to, building, to build on. We see that almost 95% of the conflicts got resolved through the peer-to-peer -peer manner. And in contrast, if the conflict unfolded in the bargaining type of process, only about 50% got resolved. And more notably, even for those 50%, a lot of them required a voting procedure or actually the decision was made by the owner unilaterally. That means actually for the bargaining type of conflict resolution, it required a um, formal authority type of figure to, um, to intervene. Another really interesting finding is that 
you could actually switch path. Let's say if a conflict started with discussion about different licenses, um, GPL and MIT, you could actually switch the discussion towards a more problem solving like path. So here I have two examples from the project Terms of Service and the project Hugo. Let's look at what Trustmaster did. So Trustmaster is just a regular participant. He's not an owner um, mm. and not an administrator, but he came in, observed the situation, reflect on the previous discussion. Then he commented like, oh guys, you have been discussing different licenses like MIT and Apache, but what really matters is we don't want so many limitations. The more limitations we have, the less likely we are going to attract people to contribute. So he moves the discussion from bargaining over which one is better to an underlying attribute that everybody cares about. Similarly, if we look at Jay, uh, Josh Blake in Project Hugo, what he did is he is summarizing, reflecting where people have been bargaining about different licenses like CCO or CCBY, then he distill that and unpack that um, to different attributes and concluded, okay, what we really care about is the free culture. We want to promote the free culture. Given this is what we all care about, how can we find the license that best suits this desirable attribute? Then the whole discussion became a search process along this um, free culture um, dimension. So it becomes a search. That is how the magic happens. In these communities, when they can switch a discussion uh, or a conflict process from a bargaining process to a problem solving process, then there is a much higher likelihood for um, for members to resolve conflict in the peer-to-peer -peer manner. And the last question would be, why would resolution matter at all? The first answer I could provide is, so if a conflict doesn't get resolved, what do they do? They could discuss that endlessly because you know, nobody is logging the time. But if they discuss that endlessly, it takes time and attention away from the more productive activities. They could also go back and start another conflict episode. So this becomes an endless loop. But more importantly, for this um, free innovation community, what's essential for the community is the contribution from participants. Here, the graph shows you um, the post-conflict activities among participants. We can see that for projects with unresolved conflict, we will, um, they will experience a sharp drop in contribution among participants. And in contrast, for projects with resolved conflict, they can even see a slight increase in contribution. So given that these communities depend on the voluntary contribution from participants, it's really important to resolve conflict to keep everybody motivated. Because remember these communities have no border. There is no contract. If participants are not satisfied by the situation, if they are demotivated, they could just leave. So eventually the survival and the prosperity of the community depends on the effective resolution of conflict. So with that, I have actually um, covered most of my content. Um, I would like you guys to um, leave the class with a few takeaways. Um, there are things that we can do um, when we collaborate either in small teams or in larger communities there are at least two sets of things we can think about. The first one is ex ante. How do you design the interaction? How do you design the interdependency rules um, in a way there is very little conflict potential? And the second is how do you prevent 
So you need to have a set of procedural, clear procedures in place, and ideally have these willing and capable third parties who can intervene and can intervene effectively. Then you can think about ex post. Once there are conflicts already, what can you do? First, you can frame and reframe conflict in a way that there is common ground for you to build on. And, and then if it is already on the way, you can still try to drive it um, towards a path that resembles um, problem solving rather than the win-lose type of bargaining process. So I hope those are helpful as you collaborate to create great things. And I thank you very much. Very good. <laughs> thank very good. you. Yeah. So Viviana, thank you. And I, <laughs> I, would, I would only mention myself and then there'll be other comments as well, I'm sure. Uh, but I'd mention myself that one of the things that happens is, for example, when you're in a business school, what you focus on is, oh, how do you manage a company? And then you're saying things like, well, you have to have an HR function. And well, the boss decides, as Viviana was saying, and so on. And how do we create promotion paths? And how do we create things having to do with salary and blah, blah, blah. And it goes on and on and on and on. And people then, when something new comes up that has nothing to do really with uh, this kind of hierarchical system, mm. namely the kind of sort of open source organizational processes we've talked about. There's this period of what the heck that can't work. As I mentioned to you, Oliver Williamson and Kenneth Arrow and others, this can't work. But what's happened is they've neglected that the rest of the life works that way, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know? You are always in your lives negotiating situations without bosses. Mm. So you have an enormous portfolio of things to draw on. It's just that it has to be sort of like integrated as Viviana is now doing it as a sort of a, a viable alternative that we really start to understand as to how the heck this happens. And then it doesn't become magic anymore. Then it becomes, oh, I get it. There's this other separate body of knowledge. So that's all I have to say. I mean, and it's, it's a wonderful, exciting thing. We, what, what will happen in business schools and so on, I predict, is that we're going to go through this period where all of a sudden they acknowledge that this kind of free and open source and the rest is really important. And that's already happening. Mm -hmm. And then they've got to deal with their assumptions and discomforts about switching over all these different areas from marketing research to management to say, well, okay, now things have to change. And people will find it very exciting, but first it's traumatic, I must confess. <laughs> so. Change is always traumatic. <laughs> yes, yes. Well, it's really funny. The people who are senior Mm -hmm. have a lot to lose because they're the ones that established and are expert in the present principles. Mm -hmm. It's the juniors who want to come. So it's you guys, in effect, who want to come and turn everything upside down because then you can sort of own the conventional wisdom. We have nothing to lose. <laughs> that's, yes, that's right. Which is why Max Planck famously said, yes, science moves ahead one funeral at a time. <laughs> so... <laughs> <laughs> on that note, uh, <laughs> is there anything else anybody else would like to say? And if not, we will just conclude a successful session. Well, thank you, you very much. Question? Yeah, of you oh, uh, someone is jumping in. I don't know. I didn't see. Jane? Um, I think Georgia has a question for you. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I, I'm just curious on like what you've seen about the interaction of like Wikipedia trolls with the, the normal editors since they don't really have the same goals. You know, they're harder to reason with and, you know, some platforms like Wikipedia have more trolls and some other innovation platforms would not have them, I imagine, but I'm just curious. Good question. Yeah. <laughs> 
So it's really funny because Wikipedia community is one of the very few communities that actually have some conflict management procedures and they, they are the only one that has a, a formal type of resolution committee. And I think that's both a result of the, the, um, the um, extremely uh, high activity of conflict and also a reason for that. Mm. Because that implies that the community does not have as strong known as the others that they need that type of um, um, setup. It also, it has something to do with the relational contract. So as, let's say, suppose your company is collaborating or um, building strategic alliance with another firm. Actually, the design of the contract reflects how much trust or how much bond you already have. If the contract is very elaborated, it is actually a sign that you do not have that much you know, trust or bonding to start with. So the Wikipedia thing is it's quite an interesting example. It is the only one that has the formal community, probably because it needed it, because of the vast yeah. um, number of contributors. Yeah. But Georgia, you know, your, your question is really good, especially nowadays when people come in with the intention to harm, and the intention to cause trouble. And mm -hmm. here, you know, firms have the ability to fire people. And uh, actually, communities also have the ability to ban people. Mm -hmm. But of course, they then come back under another name and so forth. <laughs> So it, it, it's a difficult thing. And I think one of the advantages that many of these communities have is that they're not involved in the, in the present, you know, political correctness wars and so on. So there were, for example, within Wikipedia, uh, cases like Obama's biography and so on, where right-wingers and left-wingers would contend and they would want to change it to, to suit their political objectives. And so then Wikipedia evolved a system of locking down certain things and just saying, no, we're, we're not allowing change within these politically uh, fragmented areas. So, so yeah, it's, 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 it's like a, it's like a, you, you have to evolve and it's like a body developing antibodies and so on, you know, it's amazing. Really good comment. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Anybody else? Erdine has a question as well. Yeah, Erdine. Yeah, thank you all. Um, and uh, I think my question builds on uh, George's. Uh, Viviana, you presented in a fascinating way the, the discussion of what these communities are today, GitHub, Wikipedia. What do you think they will be tomorrow? How do you think they will change? What is the future of these communities? And what new innovation communities do, do you imagine? Um, mm -hmm. For example, would uh, Pokemon Go, would you consider that um, an innovation community of some kind? Do you think that shows us what communities will become or can be? Mm -hmm. I'm really curious to hear your thoughts. That's a wonderful question. I think I'm gonna answer it a different way. Is so when we thought, we used to think about communities as something as exceptional something that exists outside what we understand as organization. I think in the future, the border between a traditional organization and this type of community we know will become blurred. Actually, we will work a lot more like uh, community members because um, as um, artificial intelligence and digital technologies um, replacing a lot of the mundane work, we will have a lot more leisure time so what we do with our leisure time is we spend it in the activities that we enjoy, right? So we have, we, we will become like those volunteers um, in certain uh, proportion of our uh, work life. And that proportion will become even larger because we will just have more time to spend in that manner. In Switzerland, we almost passed this um, unconditional income, that means you don't have to go to work for any company, you will receive 4,000 francs. So the result of that is we, 
will tolerate a lot less um, about uh, hierarchy. Because once you are not, you don't have to be paid to tolerate the, uh, the hierarchy. We, our um, natural instinct is to organize in a non-hierarchical way. So those communities will resemble the future of organizations a lot more. So actually what we see today as the exception in the near future or the longer term future will become the norm. That's a wonderful answer. That's really interesting. Thank you. <laughs> Very cool. Thank you. All right. So thanks, everybody. See you. Thank you all. This Bye. was fantastic. Yeah, Bye. fantastic. Good job.